Well, thank you very much for that. And maybe you should just keep on your feet because I know this next presentation is gonna have you all hooting and hollering and everyone's gonna be pretty excited because tonight as we get to the last part of our program, it's my pleasure to introduce a great airman, a great leader, and an even better friend, Lieutenant, or <laughs> Lieutenant General, that was last week or two weeks ago, <laughs> General Car Carlton D. Everett II, we all know him as Dewey. I tell you, he's got 31 years of service, and if we wrote a script to try and figure out who should be the next commander of Air Mobility Command and who would be best qualified, you'd turn to General Everhart. He's done tours. He started in C-130s. He was in C-17s. He's flown just about every one of our mobility aircraft. He's commanded at the squadron group and NAF level. He's held all the key jobs. He was a numbered Air Force commander over in Europe at 3rd Air Force. And now he had 18th Air Force. He was the commander of TACC. All that, and you throw in some time while he was running around the White House as the military aide to the president. You're not gonna find a better man, one who is more open and honest with the mobility airmen that we have than General Everhart. And this afternoon, we get to hear him speak. But in keeping with the current trend of all our speakers, you're gonna see a video and then you're gonna see General Everhart. So ladies and gentlemen, please run the video. Don't you cry no How about that video? Does that just not get you going? You know where I'm from in the southern mountains of Virginia, that's what we call some giddy up and some get her done. You know, I am pumped up and I'm honored, honored to be here. General Light, thank you and the Airlift Tanker Association for another outstanding event. You know, there is no conference, and I would submit to you no conference like this in all of DOD or in the Air Force. We had a great presentation by Secretary James, General Welsh, and Chief Cody. And it is always nice to have our Air Force leadership to recognize you and to thank you personally for what you do each and every day. So a round of applause to you. We had a great professional development opportunity and we had a great chance to learn a few things. The exhibit hall gives us the opportunity to interact with one another. Industry learns from our airmen, and our airmen gains insights to what the future might hold. And finally, this conference, more than anything else, it gives us a chance to enjoy the camaraderie we have as airmen to share our ideas and to listen to stories of our leaders. And speaking of leaders, I want you to meet a few that are sitting here in this front row. 
You know, it was just a few short years ago that I actually sat in the audience where you are and I listened to the state of Air Mobility Command. And I will tell you this, I still listen to these leaders today. To our distinguished guests, Colonel Jackson and Miss Rose, thank you so much for what you do for Air Mobility Command. Thank you, sir, for what you do for the United States Air Force. Thank you. Before I introduce also to the general officers and thank them, I want to thank my wingman and my battle buddy. Chief Gamble, thank you for what you've done to our airmen and what you have done to our enlisted corps. You are going to be missed, and thank you for being here on this last event. God bless you. General McDo, General Cassidy, General Fogelman, General McNabb, General Beggart, General North, General Johns, J.J. Jackson, sir, thank you for being here. Our senior leaders, our government officials, industry partners, award winners, leaders across our entire total force, but most importantly to our airmen, thank you for being part of this 47th gathering of the Airlift Tanker Association. You know, there are a lot of ATA staff members and volunteers, as well as airmen across your staff and across the command who worked very, very hard to make this event possible. And I'm sure that every person in this room benefited from their hard work. Thank you for your dedication and thank you for your commitment to this special event. I hope all of us have gained a new and renewed sense of pride and appreciation for the complex mission that you perform each and every day. Folks, I'm telling you, you absolutely rock. Yes, you are busy. Yes, you are deployed. And yes, there are times when you might say, I didn't sign up for this. But nothing in you do that you will ever do in the future will ever replace the sense of purpose that you will get from serving in the United States Air Force. Just ask these ladies and gentlemen on the front row. I guarantee you they would trade it all in again to be part of the mission that gets it out the door and be part of rapid global mobility. What you do is critical work and what you do is noble work. Whether your mission is airlift, air refueling, air support in the mobility world, or air medical evacuation, each one of you has a story to tell. And in fact, at this very moment, you are writing a new chapter in our mobility history. From our senior leaders to our youngest airmen, the common thread has always been you our airmen. And if you hear anything that I say, anything that I say today, I want you to listen to me this one thing very clearly. It is a profound statement. We are global mobility and we are air power. So today... So today... I want to talk to you about a little bit about our core functions. I want to tell you some stories. I want to talk about where we're going and where we've been. But first, I want to thank you for an incredible year. We have been busy, and you are all part of the network that makes it happen. Active duty, guard, reserve, civilians, industry partners, you empower our nation to be able to put the American flag on the ground nearly anywhere at a moment's notice at any time. I'm telling you, 
That's some buzz-filled words from an old hokey Virginia Tech grad. And I want you to listen to this carefully and listen to it again, so please listen. You enable us to put an American flag anywhere in the world at a moment's notice. You do that. No one else, and no one does it better. Last year at this time, we were in full stride with Operation United Assistance. Tankers, they were supporting Operation Inherent Resolve to answer the threat of the Islamic State. At the same time, retrograde operations were happening in Afghanistan. Operation Enduring Freedom came to an end. Operations Freedom Sentinel was just beginning. We answered the call to humanitarian aid. Contingency response airmen strengthened the, the en route structure and air medical evacuation bought our wounded life-saving care. And oh, by the way, mobility airmen continued to provide presidential support and run those special airlift missions that enabled American diplomacy. And our incredible mobility machine maintained the presence in all corners of the globe. During the last 12 months, we watched the world change. Growing tensions in the Middle East, in the South China Sea, in all areas of the world garnered the attention of our leaders at the highest levels. Near peer competitors such as China and Russia are aggressively closing the technological gap. Competition in the cyber domain, as we heard from General Bender, is an ever-present challenge and the nuclear playing field is only growing in complexity. Still, our military stands ready to promote peace and stability and when necessary, we will respond to those who do us harm. How does our military respond? Well, folks, it's us. We are global reach. We are air power. We are American airmen who get the job done. Rapid global mobility is essential to our nation's response, and it is growing in the demand for what we do every single day. The key to mobility enterprise past, present, and future is a well-educated and professionally developed airman. And when I say airman, I mean airman with a big A, our total force. Our people, our airmen, are our most valuable weapon system. This week during ATA, we combined the power of airmen and the resources of industry we celebrated innovative culture and discussed the future of global reach. We brought in High Flight and Phoenix Strike and Cornerstone and nine other mini conferences to develop our core of officers, enlisted, and civilians. But education is not enough. In order to shape our global enterprise, we must face the challenges and find ways to succeed against overwhelming odds, like the selfless airmen before us. None of us were saints. Far from it. We just refused to believe that the line between right and wrong was hard to see. People always know the right thing to do but they hesitate because they think of themselves. The things we did, we did because we cared more about duty than glory. We cared more about getting it done than getting a medal. We never thought, how could I do this? We thought, how could we not do this? What were we gonna do? Let somebody else do our job? Because it was hard? We want you to fly this jet through the sound barrier. Yes, sir. We need you to jump out of a balloon in outer space to see if a human can survive the fall. Yes, sir. We need you to fly a bomber from an aircraft carrier for a raid on Tokyo, and you probably won't come back. Yes, sir. Selflessness only means something when you have something to give. Airmen, you have so much inside you, you have no idea. You will think of your mission, and you will think of your country, and you will not hesitate. Some people think we're trained so that we don't think. We just react. No. In the Air Force, 
we're just trained to think faster. We are required to think at three times the speed of sound. A hundred billion terabytes come at you in a nanosecond, and 300 million American heartbeats are waiting and wondering what you're going to do to keep them safe right now. Fear is natural. The most primitive human instinct is to save your own skin, to think of yourself first, to wonder who will make that sacrifice for me. If I'm watching over the world, who's watching over me? We are. Aim high, airmen. You know, our past is full of stories like you, the one you just saw, but I have another one for you. Seven decades ago, mobility airmen used the C-47 to fly the hump. Army Air Forces were given the monumental task to fly cargo from India over the Himalayas into China. They lacked the capability and in both training and equipment to be able to accomplish that task, but bold, brave airmen answered the call and met the challenge with to beat overwhelming odds. The cost was high in aircraft and in lives. Their sacrifice led to a better understanding of airlift. General William Tunner, commander of the mission known as the Hump, and father of what later became Air Mobility Command, said this about his troops. Only such airmen dedicated to air transport can direct this complex new military service with full efficiency. Now we may not be at full efficiency, but I guarantee you we are pretty darn close. Earlier this year, a devastating earthquake struck Nepal. Mobility airmen responded to the same area that we responded to over seven decades ago. This time we had the right training. This time we had the right equipment. Let me introduce to you Colonel Lindsay and Brian Ertz. They're going to tell you what teamwork's all about and rapid global mobility happened in the enterprise on that day, on April 25th. On April 25th, just past noon, we received notification of a massive earthquake in the country of Nepal. Pretty extensive damage, over 600,000 homes destroyed, 9,000 lives lost. The government declared a state of emergency and requested international assistance. The USAID offered up $1 million worth of aid, but they needed some way to get that assistance to the local populace. The first step in a response to an emerging situation is to collect as much data as you possibly can. The second piece is to put together a list of what assets we might have available. And then the third step is to pull together a multifunctional team of all the relevant expertise. That's maintenance, that's our contingency response element forces, that's our aerial port experts, our mission planners, uh, maintainers, flight managers, diplomatic clearance personnel as well as flight planners to put together a plan or a potential course of action uh, and then the final step would be to select one of those courses of actions and execute. The 618th AOC planned, tasked and executed the first two U.S. airlift missions into the country of Nepal. The first C-17 was airborne within 16 hours of that notification. The second aircraft was airborne later that same day. The primary planning for these missions was conducted jointly by the floor duty officers and the backshop SAM planners from the current operations directorate. The first mission was supported by a C-17 from McGuire and it flew down to Dover, picked up 69 search and rescue members and 70,000 pounds of cargo. The second mission came from Charleston and flew out to March, California picked up 57 search and rescue team members and two trucks worth of heavy duty equipment. These missions provided a lot of unique challenges. Starting with, uh, to get into Nepal is typically a 21 day lead time. So obviously we didn't have that and naturally Nepal was going to let us in, but we also had to fly over a number of other countries that maybe didn't have the urgency that Nepal would have. So our planners and our dip shop had to work with the foreign embassies and the DAOs to get those clearances and some 
pretty heroic work was done to get 55 clearances in a 24-hour period. Maybe the most difficult part was arranging for an air refueling. Um, due to the short notice to get the equipment and people there as expeditiously as possible, we scheduled an air refueling. So all of those things combined together with the fact that we had to have this in 16 hours was a great challenge. And it's really rewarding to be part of a team that can make this type of mission happen. That's saving lives and delivering critical cargo to people that have just suffered through a disaster. It's uh, very rewarding to know that I was part of that team that got that equipment on the ground, those people were there, and that we saved lives, and it's probably the best part of my job. We have come a long way in the last 70 years. What about the next 70? Our nation needs mobility airmen to lead us to a future where today's innovations become routine. Later this evening, ATA will recognize the individuals in this photo for their key roles to refining the design of the C-17. These airmen exemplified the strength of our enlisted force. They played a vital role in shaping the aircraft that made rapid response to Nepal crisis and other missions across the world routine. Gentlemen, thank you for your enduring contribution to rapid global mobility and to air power. <laughs> Other airmen like these, they helped design the C-5M and the C-130J. You know, the C-5M is a game changer in speed and range and payload. As a matter of fact, it has set airlift 43 airlift records so far. And to say that it's your granddad's aircraft is, uh, well, I just think that's a vast understatement. You know, back in October of 2001, then General Tony Robinson and a mobility team faced a huge challenge. They had to get supplies from Guam over to Diego, Diego Garcia to be able to take the fight to Osama bin Laden. And oh, by the way, the Director of Air Mobility Forces at that time, if I'm not mistaken, was Colonel Darren McDew. Oh, and I'm telling you, what a monumental feat. They had 22 legacy C-5s broken on the ramp at Guam at one time. Do you not think that they could have used some of these? Or how about some of these. You know, it's been written that the C-130 is the most flexible airlifter in the world, and it is a perfect complement to round out our mobility platforms. I will offer to you that our mobility fleet is in a pretty good place right now, but what about the future? What will the CX look like? What new capabilities will it bring? In the very new future, we will work closely with our joint partners to design a cargo space that will give our users more agility and more situational awareness as they're en route to the drop zone or in a contested environment. But many questions remain. Will the next airlifter be a communications node? How will it operate in contested environments? Will it be manned? We are laying the foundation right now for a mobility requirement study that will answer some of those questions. And truth be told, I'm not sure what this next future aircraft will look like, but I do know one thing for certain. Together, our airmen and our industry partners will drive the best solution. And yet, that's not enough. As our mobility fleet evolves, we must evolve also to advance the way we train. We need to get more bang out of every training dollar that we have. So when we exercise, we will do it with our joint and international partners, just like we did with Talisman Sabre.
Talisman Sabre showcased exactly what rapid global mobility can do. Dropping paratroopers is a capability that we train for all the time. This mission was different because as you saw, paratroopers jumped in after a 16 hour trans-Pacific flight. The Royal Australian Air Force and five airlift wings participated in that drop, including the reserve wing from the 446 airlift wing. Seven KC-10s enabled a non-stop flight. A joint force, a total force, delivered an air power package of 450 paratroopers. The ability for us to respond to areas of the world separated by vast stretches of ocean with limited en route support structures is totally awesome. Rapid global mobility makes that happen. Now just think for a moment, if you would. Can you imagine what our adversaries think when they see this capability? A mere 16 hours after making a really bad decision, me and 500 of my best friends land in their backyard. Do you not think that would change their calculus? But you know what? It's just not airlift. Tankers play a big, big role. You know, the KC-135 has been the bedrock of our air refueling fleet for over 60 years. And I will tell you that Anyone with a tanker background will joke that when the last F-22 flies to the boneyard, it's probably going to be enabled by dual AR, uh, dual AR uh, KC-135s. Now, if you think about in the past and you look at this picture, members of the Young Tiger Tanker Task Force often flew in the skies of, of Vietnam supporting the fight. And airborne controllers will often ask those young tigers, hey, can you take a vector? And that was code for, can you fly up into North Vietnamese airspace, support those fighters to help bring the rain against the enemy that we're fighting? And I will tell you, their answer was always a resounding yes. Now let's flash forward to the future. Actually, to the present. Back in December of last year, the crew of Elite 6-0 answered an alert call to support troops in contact. And with an hour of that call, their KC-135 was airborne. During the next six hours, they conducted air refuelings against, with multiple fighters and AFSOC aircraft. This was done at 5,000 feet above the ground at night in mountainous terrain. The crew and their defenseless KC-135, and I say defenseless because they didn't have air defenses systems, they encountered enemy fire and their radios were jammed all along the way, but they stayed in the fight. As a matter of fact, when they got low on gas, they coordinated with another tanker, received that gas so they could stay in the fight longer supporting those troops in contact. And they did all this before they diverted to a high-risk recovery airfield. I submit to you that I think those, tanker, those Tiger crews in Vietnam would be proud of Elite 6-0. Their actions and their actions alone resulted in 33 KIA. They provided life-saving support for coalition ground forces and enabled the medevac of a critically wounded soldier. Ladies and gentlemen, global mobility is air power. Missions like this don't happen every day. Our airmen train so our partners know that we will always be there when we're called. And remember this, and remember this because it's important. Literally, hundreds of airmen touched that mission, touched that alert mission before it launched. Every one of those airmen touched the lives of those troops on the ground. Mobility airmen right now are all floating more fuel to support the fight against Islamic State than when we did when we had 130,000 troops on the ground in Iraq. 
the demand for tanker gas is high. But it isn't limited to the Middle East. And let me give you an example. Back in 2013, in February, two B-2s flew a 37-hour mission to drop dummy bombs on a range in South Korea as part of an exercise. This unique capability assures our allies and our partners that we will always be there. It deters aggressive action. It demonstrates our reach into the Pacific. And it would not have been possible without the support of over 25 KC-10s and KC-135s. Now I tell you, we all have seen leaders in that part of the world. And you've seen one of those leaders that have this fancy hairdo. But I guarantee you, in his vocabulary, when he hears the words B2, he's going to have a bad hair day. <laughs> I know I would. Now more than ever, our tankers must stand ready for all missions, especially the nuclear deterrence mission. But it's not easy as it used to be. Peer nations are refining technologies to deny us access to airspace. We've got to think about how tankers will operate in contested environments. The KC-46 is a step in the right direction. Advanced avionics and communications equipment will increase the situational awareness for the operators so they can get closer to the fight. But gaining access to the airspace is only one of our challenges. We also need to establish a ground presence. Our expeditionary capability provided by our contingency response airmen plays a key role in America's 911 force. Their mission is to deploy versatile airmen into complex environments to kick down those doors. Five months ago, Mobility Airmen from the 621st Contingency Response Wing opened a base in Iraq that was only miles from the front lines. These 42 airmen from 10 different duty AFCs did everything from filling sandbags to conducting dual runway operations. They handled up to 14 aircraft and 125 short tons of cargo per night. With battle rattle, with MVGs loaded with their weapons. To the outsider, it looks like it just happens. But it happens because of a very talented team that I am proud to call Mobility Airmen. deployed setting, my unit is right-sized, trained and equipped to respond and open an airbase, regardless of service, uh, within 12 hours of notification. So for the instance of this uh, mission, we were the right capability to deploy in very short notice and what we bring is the capability, all the capabilities required to open and operate an airfield. Feeling my way through the darkness Guided by a beating heart I can't tell where my journey will end But I know where to start We are a mobility amplifier to uh, mobilize the fight wherever it needs to go by bringing in what the Air Force brings in which is that logistics uh, global reach into any part of the world.
I want to highlight a key takeaways from that operation. First, mobility airmen and the complexity of the mission is often misunderstood by our sister services. Second, the task force leadership at Ida Kadem was made up of Marines, and they were surprised that our contingency response airmen could actually live like Marines. But after seeing what our men and women could do in action, their perception of our airmen changed. This is Tech Sergeant Michael Folk. His duty AFC says he's a loadmaster, but I want to call him a leader. He led the effort at Atticatum. NCOs like Sergeant Folk are the foundation of our military. They are busy developing tactics, techniques, and procedures across our command, and they are the key to improving rapid global mobility. I wanted to thank Tech Sergeant Folk in, per in person, but he couldn't make it. His commander, Lieutenant Colonel Benwitz, is here to represent him. Kyle, would you please stand up and thank you for your support and everything that your team is doing to improve air mobility support. <laughs> From Mata Kadem to Nepal. From Talisman Saber to Inherent Resolve. Everything we do happens because of extremely talented airmen. You control the global AOR with an ta aircraft taking off every two and a half minutes. There are thousands of people who come together to make the mission happen. From intel to admin to flight managers to command post controllers. Airmen are our most valuable weapon system. From security forces to fleet service to maintenance to air airport, airmen are our most precious valuable weapon system and families are there to support them every step of the way. Everything we talked about today happens because of you. Our mission, our duties, require oftentimes that we put our most valuable resource, our airmen, in harm's way. And sometimes the unthinkable happens. Unfortunately, that happened recently with the loss of Torque 62. I would like to pause for a moment to remember those who have paid the ultimate sacrifice. I take comfort and knowing that Air Mobility Command Airmen who have gone before us welcome Torque 62 home with open arms. You know, life, the loss of life is a harsh reality in our line of work. But we have made vast improvements to save lives. And we have come a long way in 25 years. The survival rate of patients has increased 20% because of airmen. What used to take 10 days to be able to get someone home with life danger inju uh, injuries now takes three days. And just a few years ago, doctors would say, you can't put that critical patient who's wounded on an airplane. And now you know what? We do it routinely. I will direct I will direct an aircraft to get our wounded every time. I don't care if cargo is late. I don't care if we miss air refueling. We will go to the end of the earth and we will spare no expense to save one life. This is Tech Sergeant Taylor Savage. And she is an outstanding combat medic. She is a below the zone promotee. She is a Diamond Sharp Award winner. And some with our best and brightest, we oftentimes have to send them in combat. And that's what we did with Sergeant Savage. She deployed out in Afghanistan in 2013. And if any one of you have ever been there, she embedded in a fob with our Army brothers and sisters in the province of Ghazni. That part of Afghanistan in Highway 1 
It was a tough piece of territory. I call that piece of Highway 1 Hell's Highway. It just so happened that two weeks before she was supposed to redeploy home, she got the call to go out and support our, um, our army, brothers and sisters, in a convoy one last time. And so off they did. Off they did. And it just so happened that the vehicle she was traveling in struck an IED. She was blown to the back of the hatch. She was hanging in a strap. She had a punctured lung. She had a piece of metal sticking in her face. And she had more broken bones than I ever would like to think about. But I will tell you, it was airmen who came to her aid. Taylor was medevaced to Fob Shank. She was aerovac to Bagram, Lonstool, and then Andrews to Walter Reed. 48 hours after her injury, Taylor arrived at Walter Reed. Amram from our VAC teams and our air transport teams watched her every heartbeat along the way. That is rapid global mobility. From an outpost in Afghanistan to Walter Reed in 48 hours, nobody else could do that in the world. Nobody. We can get a patient, if we can get a patient, to the high level of care in the first golden hour, they have a 98% chance of survival. Staff Sergeant Taylor Savage made the choice to serve, a choice to risk her life for others. She is alive today because of thousands of our men and women made the same choice. Sergeant Savage will be the first one to tell you that it was not machines and airplanes that saved her, people did. She will also tell you that her positive attitude and support network are vital to her recovery. Her mom took a year off from work to be at Walter Reed. Taylor's care manager, Etta Dalton, and her recovery care coordinator, Jennifer Roman, were instrumental in her recovery. You know, I talked to Taylor the other day, and she wants you to know a couple of things. First, the choice you made to serve sometimes comes with real risk. You need to be prepared. You've got to be prepared. She practiced with her Army brothers and sisters every day on combat medic techniques, so she was prepared. Second, she wants you to know that she appreciates the improvements that you made to global, global, rapid global mobility, and she is alive today because of them. You know, I started talking about people, and this is where I'm in. Make no mistake about it. Airmen are our most valuable weapon system. The people in this audience will determine what Air Mobility Command looks like in the future. Airmen will develop the next airlifter. Airmen will develop the next tanker. We will continue to improve air mobility support, and we will continue to save lives. How will you use directed energy, hypersonics, nanotechnology, remotely piloted or autonomous systems? Are there answers in these technologies that the next tanker and airlifter will utilize, or will they use something else that something has not even been thought of? Or imagine yet. Does someone in this audience have an idea that will make the difference tomorrow? I know one thing for certain. Airmen will develop those capabilities to guarantee global reach in the future. It is what we do. It is in our blood. And we are known for our excellence. When we told people we were in the Air Force, they always asked, what kind of plane do you fly? We didn't all join the Air Force to be pilots. We joined the Air Force because we were different. We saw things differently. We looked for better ways. We expected more out of ourselves. The Air Force was a place where excellence is a standard, not an achievement. 
We knew we had it in us to do things other people didn't have the strength, the vision, or the courage to do. The world was full of people who would sure try real hard and then tell you they were sorry. That wasn't us. That's not you. We go faster, we go higher, we go farther, we do more and we do better every day. We find a way, excellence in everything we do, no matter what you do. There are no small jobs in the Air Force. You don't hide here. This is no place for lazy or having a bad day. There's a reason the crew chief's name is on the plane. Everything matters. The uniform we issued broke the sound barrier. The reports we filed put bombs on target. The meals we cooked fueled this Air Force. Greatness will emerge in the places it is required. Your name may not make the history books or a plaque on a wall, but one day your name will be written in stone, just like ours. We will all be remembered by the people whose lives we changed, by the airmen we served with, by the values we honor every day. Excellence is our standard. Excellence is our tradition. Excellence is not what you reach for. Excellence is the foundation you stand on to reach higher. We were never given permission to be average. Not from our superiors, not from our country, not from ourselves. We gave everything. We didn't leave any jobs for you to finish. We left a mission for you to continue. Aim high, Airmen. Do you realize how important you are? You under, do you understand the impact your job has on lives of others? I am Tech Sergeant Astria Gathings. I was a part of the Altakatum team, and I am Air Power. I'm Marty Schroyer. I allocate airlift missions like the one that enabled the Nepal response. I am air power. I am Captain Justin Munger. I was a pilot on Elite 60, and I am air power. I am Captain David Jehoviak. I was a medical crew director on Staff Sergeant Savage's flight from Afghanistan, and I am air power. My name is Staff Sergeant Taylor Savage, and I am air power. Thank you all for being here and thank you for what you do. Taylor, I'm glad that you could be here today. Thank you. Your story is incredible and I am humbled to be able to tell it. But I need another minute because I forgot to mention two people earlier. When Taylor deployed, she was one of three combat medics. The other two happened to be FEMA Airmen, Staff Sergeant Maria Zeminski, and Staff Sergeant Amber Frederick. The three of them had a special pact that they would take care of each other if any one of them were involved in an incident with an IED. And as fate would have it, 
Staff Sergeant Maria Zamansky was the first vehicle to respond and Staff Sergeant Amber Frederick was close behind. And despite being disoriented, Taylor recognized Maria and smiled. Maria and Amber made good on that pact. Taylor, I know that you are grateful for all the men and women that helped you along the way. And I know that you wanted me to personally thank Maria and Amber. But you know what? I think it's better if we thank them in person. Maria and Amber, would you please come out? Ladies and gentlemen, Global Reach would not be possible without these airmen. Global Reach would not be possible without you. Next year, each of us will write our story, and every story is crucial to our legacy. These are the stories that we would tell our grandchildren. I want you to be proud of our legacy, and I want you to be proud of your mission and be proud of your story. Ladies and gentlemen, we are Global Mobility. And global mobility is air power. Thank you, God bless you, and God bless America. Well done. Great job. What? What? Y'all held it to me. Thank you. I'll let you go that way. Or